Hello and welcome to The Open Road. This is a podcast in which we discuss various issues around the open source ecosystem and our experiences with it. I'm Rich Bowen. I work in the Open Source Program Office at Red Hat. And I am Ryan Prophet, also with the same Open Source Program Office. And thanks for joining us today. Now, if you've been following us for the last few episodes, you'll know that we're talking about foundations and mm -hmm. when and why a project should go to an open source foundation. In this episode, we're actually going to give our contestants, I mean, our uh, our guests, a uh, <laughs> an opportunity to, to plug their own particular foundation um, and kind of give an idea of why you should choose their foundation for your project from their perspective. Okay. We're going to start this by talking with Guy Martin, who is the executive director of the Oasis Open Foundation. And again, if you've listened to our previous episodes, you've got some some context about what that foundation is about. But in this in this clip here, we asked Guy, why should a project bring their their project to your foundation, to Oasis Open. And this was his perspective on that. <laughs> well, you know, I, I often say to our staff and to board, and Rich, you've heard me say this, this, that I think the one thing Oasis, one of the big things Oasis provides is that we're big enough to matter, but we're still small enough to care. And we're small enough to give individual attention to, to these open source projects. And also the fact that we provide an easy way to go from a pro open source code base to potentially an international standard through our de jure standardization process on our relationship with ISO, ITU, and other standards bodies is important. Now I know, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about, oh, well, shouldn't the standard just be the one code base? But that sort of monoculture of, of uh, you know, one code base is really a problem when you get to highly regulated industries and highly regulated pipe uh, procurement pipelines, which A, want a standard, and A, want that uh, ability to have a different implementation, maybe a more performant implementation, an implementation written in a different language because that's a, a requirement for some other thing. And really the only way you can get that is to go, is to, to get the standard um, developed. But it's also challenging, right? Because we all see that people, I think in the open source world have this perspective of, oh gosh, standards, right? I don't wanna take two years to slog <laughs> through this. Whereas starting from the, the code, kind of starting from that code base, if you have it, mm -hmm. and then finding a way to, to easily transition that to an inter, to an, a potential international standard through Oasis is a really important thing. And I think we have that experience to give open open source projects about, hey, here's a little bit more what the governance can look like. And, you know, hey, let's let's coach you a little bit on taking your, your API and using that as the bones of the standard. I mean, that's a great example of what Baseline did, right? They took their API, it's being used as the bones of that standard. And it's giving that opportunity for that technology to, to spread out and be um, be implemented in, in different uh, languages and different environments, but still conform to that interoperability. So first off, I, I'm i just reviewing the budget for prizes for the contestants because we didn't talk about <laughs> that before. So just so we're all clear, writing that down is a, a thing to do. Well, that, yeah, so Guy is always is our very, our, you know, one of our more articulate friends, which is probably why we invited him on. Um, he gives a really uh, interesting look at how Oasis Open functions um, because it really did kind of start out as a standards body. And, and now it is, you know, moved beyond that. And it, it, I like the way he kind of clarified it for, for me because I was never really sure how that was going to work when I first heard about it. And uh, full disclosure here, I am on the board of directors of the Oasis Foundation. And uh, so I've, I've had to articulate this some to, to some of our members as well. Um, and, and, and I feel like that, that tie between um, open standards and open source is very, very much part of our history of open source. You know, in the early days when we would uh, a, a lot of open source projects were, in fact, an implementation of a of an open standard, and and Oasis is kind of uh, going to those roots and drawing on those roots as as a, as as a place where standards based projects might land. So, yeah, it's been it's been interesting working with with them as they try and figure out how to 
how to best cater to open source projects that that aren't used to this tight tight tie between standards and open source that used to be so much part of how we did things. Right. Right. And well, and, and it was a part of, I remember standards coming up in almost every conversation, whether it was open yeah. source or not, um, but mostly open source because we would have the discussion. I remember, well, I'm old enough to remember, you know, the browser wars and even yeah. then, and that was, that was proprietary space, but are you going to build around uh, Netscape? Um, are you going to build around Internet Explorer and then the divergent forms of HTML that sort of sure, yeah. showed up? Yeah. And then we had to, you know, kind of lump all that back in together. And, and, and now you talk to people about that and they're like, you argued about what? <laughs> and, and then I show them the blink tag and they're terrified. Um, but, but, but it was a part of the discussion. So it's, um, and as you said, no surprise that it showed up when open source was fresh and new and um, it doesn't come up very often, but it still does happen. In, in corporate circles, it almost feels like now, instead of a standards body, the the conversation is more around um, implementing standards through attrition. Like enough people get behind this methodology, it becomes a de facto standard. Sure, and, and Oasis is very much the the traditional. Let's create the standard and then mm -hmm. build an implementation around it. So. Yeah. Another thing that he pointed out, and I think this applies to any kind of foundation, whether it's standards oriented or, or not, was I liked his line where he said, you know, we're small enough to care, but big enough to matter. Yeah. Um, that was a really good, that's, I, you know, I pretty, you know, copyright be darned. I think that all foundation, <laughs> all foundation just steal that line. Um, Cause it was, it's good. It's a good summation of no matter what the mission is, that's kind of what a foundation should be doing for its constituent projects. Our next guest is Shane Kirkaroo, who's been involved with the Apache Software Foundation for going on 20 years. And uh, we asked him this, this same question if I have an open source project, why should I consider taking it to the Apache Software Foundation? Yeah, no, uh, uh, Apache offers the the whole breadth of services. If you want long-term independent project governance, you want your project to have a chance to be here in 50 years, which is what the foundation's goal is. Um, immaterial of where when technologies change or immaterial of whether or not the latest VC company wants to, you know, think your project is hot, and then they suddenly think your project isn't hot. Um, all of those concerns, uh, sure, they affect every project. But at Apache, you have the chance to get enough mentoring, to have the breadth of sort of um, respect for governance that other people will see, that people will come to the project if they have an interest, obviously, um, and help this project for itself, for its own community of users, not for commercial corporations, not for people who want to necessarily pay for it, but for users to maintain the project as long as someone's around. So it, the point is, it's not the biggest question about coming to Apache for some founders is you need to be ready to say, it's not my project anymore. It's the community's project, right? You're, you're giving it to Apache and Apache as an organization, we don't, we don't do anything with it, right? We give a space for a community to then embody that project and govern that project. So if you're ready for that, then absolutely come to the ASF. If you still believe, you know, you're going to be the benevolent dictator or, you know, if you clearly have a vision that you're not going to change, even with other input, then it, the ASF is not the right place. Um, and again, Apache is very clear, you know, we want projects who want to be here. Mm -hmm. uh, which almost every foundation does, right? But but we're very explicit about it. We we will clearly tell someone, hey, you know, we think that's not a good fit. Maybe you should go someplace else. Which uh, is not very salesman-y, but um, that's that's what makes sense for our communities. So, all right. So I hear Shane focusing on on 
two things. Maybe there was more here, but I, I heard um, sustainability. I want to make sure that my project remains around after I or my company or even the founders of the project lose interest. And a focus on community ownership so that the community, uh, the community owns, maintains, continues to produce the code, which is also part of the sustainability mess message, I guess. So that's, mm -hmm. that's what I'm hearing he, him pitching as the, uh, the pillars of why you might want to take something to the Apache Software Foundation. Right. And, and, and that, that is in line with a lot of what we often think about when we, when we hear the call, um, you know, for any given project that, you know, is coming up and coming and say, oh, you should put that in a foundation. Um, you know, we, ha we, we've had this discussion, you know, Rackspace got that when they, you know, came up with OpenStack, mm -hmm. um, you know, Docker came, they, you know, they were kind of hammered on that a little bit when they were up and coming. Um, and so far they basically resisted that. Um, and you, know, you could argue for both, for both instances, whether that was good or bad for sure. the people involved, but it, the argument was always um, about sustainability. We, we want this software to be around um, for the long term, whether or not, you know, whether or not the company is around or not. And, and that's interesting because, you know, you would think that the open source license would be enough. Um, and I know that's not true, but I, I do hear that as a pushback from, sure. from people. And, and it's a hard argument to counter at first because you're like, well, they're like, well, why, why, why should I put it in a foundation? Because the code is always open. And then now you have to get into the, well, there's trademark, um, which is yeah. a hurdle. It is. And that's one of the things when you take a project to, to Apache and to, to most foundations, mm -hmm. there's a trademark grant associated with that. And that is no longer yours. That belongs to the foundation. Right. And you'll you'll see some variation in that between different foundations, but that's that's a pretty standard, pretty standard way to do things. Right, and 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 in some cases, that's going to be that alone is enough. I mean, I remember because I disclosure here, I worked at the Linux Foundation um, just after they had officially hired um, Linus Torvalds, and as part of that acqui hire. And, and getting him away from the company that he worked for at the time, you know, they also took care of the marks. The marks were being held by Linus Torvalds and another independent group. And eventually the Linux Foundation, you know, took them in. And that was good for Linux because at the time <clears throat> there, there was a lot of, it was a wild west as far as, you know, what yeah. constituted Linux and, and what did not. So, you know, that, that part of the sustainability argument is certainly one that always comes up. Uh, I, I was very tickled when Shane, and he's not wrong, we just haven't been around long enough to see it, when he says, that, you know, the goal is to keep things around for up to 50 years. And, you know, I've barely been around 50, <laughs> a little bit more. But that just seems, but to apply that to software where, you know, thing, you know, things just come and go so rapidly. Yeah. Um, that is an interesting uh, statement to make. And he's making a reference there to uh, a keynote at ApacheCon 10 years ago, 12 mm -hmm. years ago, in which uh, Greg Stein said, this, this is our goal is to build governance that is not dependent on particular individuals such that the foundation will still be around in 50 years and look pretty much like it does now with appropriate changes as the world changes around it. And, and that's that's kind of been a one of our driving mantra. Again, full disclosure, I have been involved with the Apache Software Foundation and served on the board. So when I say our, that's that's been one of Apache's um, driving forces for the last decade. This is basically why Rich and I are friends because he knows everybody. So. <laughs> Because he does all the stuff. 
I just I just bring you know liquid refreshments along. <laughs> That's my job in this. Um, and and but kidding aside, I I do, and this is one of the things, and this is again goes to sustainability. Um, and we've talked about this before. The thing that I love about the Apache Software Foundation that really speaks to sustainability in a practical way more than anything else is the concept of the attic. Um, and I don't want to spend too long on that, but I think that that solution has is brilliant. And and I know you know there haven't really been examples of projects pulled out of an attic before. But just the fact that they're there mm -hmm. and they could be and save somebody some work down the line and they don't have to reinvent the wheel is is wonderful. And there was one project that was mm -hmm. that was brought out of the attic and I off the top of my head, I cannot remember which one it was. But yeah, the, the attic is an is a recognition that that software goes through a, a cycle and sometimes it's no longer relevant either because the technology is obsolete. A lot of our XML projects are no longer the hot thing. But if you end up with a piece of software that relies on that, you know that those releases are still available for you. All the mailing list archives are still available for you. All of the source history is still there. So yeah, it's a it's an important resource historically, but also functionally because um, you know, as as we saw in the year 2000, and as we've seen many times since then, there's software that's been around for 50 years, and mm -hmm. at some point you have to make a modification on it, and you you kind of need the the context around why a particular change was made, uh, why a patch was rejected, all this sort of stuff that the attic keeps in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so definitely definitely a big plus for the sustainability argument. So our, our last guest today, and last but not least, is our, our friend Vicky Bressour, um, who is a free and open source software business consultant. And Vicky is currently not working in a, a foundation right now. She certainly had a lot of experience with them. So she kind of flipped the question around um, on us that because we asked the same question to all of our guests. And she came back with an answer that was really modeled about, okay, if I'm a project, you know, um, why should I come to your, why any foundation? So let, that's the way that question sort of got flipped. And here was her response. Actually, I'd rather turn it on its head because I've, I've worked on the other side and worked with projects. Why a, okay, you think you need a foundation, um, or you think you need some sort of administrative oversight of some variety, what are you going to pick, right? Um, which is the opposite side yeah. of that. And what I find is that typically projects can't answer the very first question, which is, what do you even need? Mm -hmm. They just have this gut feeling, we need something else, and they can't really put their finger on what they need. Um, and they their needs tend to fall into different buckets, um, like some of them just need somebody to hold the money and to deal with the taxes. Um, and then they're going to do everything else. And others, they need money plus legal support, some money, legal support, infrastructure or money, legal support, infrastructure, governance. Right. And, and those tend to be the four major buckets. Right. Money is the big one. Legal support, infrastructure, governance. Um, and most of them don't know where they fall on that spectrum. Right. Um, and if you don't know that, you can't really make a good determination of which foundation, which fiscal sponsor or whatever is going to be a good fit for your project. For instance, some just say money and then they want to go to perhaps Open Collective. OK, great. Open Collective does a lot of good work. But is it going to be a good fit for you? Um, Open Collective works on a reimbursement model at the moment, and perhaps they will change it at some point, which means that you pay, say, the cloud computing costs for your project up front, and then you get reimbursed, and they'll handle the taxes and all that good stuff. That's a good fit for some projects, but for others, people don't have that money up front. And so how do you handle that? Uh, 
Do you want to go to something more like Software Freedom Conservancy, where all of the money goes to Conservancy and they manage it all and handle all that administrivia for you? Um, but they also predominantly pick own select only free software projects, copyleft projects. Mm -hmm. Is that a good fit for your product? Um, so you have to, as a project, really look at your needs. What are your buckets? Who services those buckets? And how do they service them? Um, it's not just, you know, pick the biggest name you know and go that right. direction because it might not be a good fit. A number of the foundations that I have looked at over the years did not do a great job with with saying who should who their who their target audience is but vicky mm -hmm. makes the very good point that you can't get what you want till you know what you want right <laughs> um and and how important it is for for projects to do the introspection do the work of figuring out what it is that they're looking for rather than just saying i want a foundation let's go down the list and, right and that, that is a that's a really important thing that that some projects are maybe not mature enough to to know. So no, that's a hard sell there. Well, I, uh, yes, and and I think I well we all have problems, you know, being self aware sometimes. <laughs> um, and to ask a group of people to be self aware is probably even more complicated. But yeah, and you know, to know where you are on the spectrum that she describes, money. Uh, legal support, infrastructure, governance. Those are those are four pretty solid pillars of any given foundation services, um, plus or minus. And to know where you are and what you need and be really aware of that is, is critical because too often, and I, I believe I've mentioned this before, even at Red Hat, we will have projects that will come to the open source program office and they will say, hey, we want to be a part of this foundation. And we're like, okay, why? And they don't really have an answer. And and I and you know, not to put too fine a point on it, you know, usually it's something around they want the press, they mm -hmm. want the yeah. announcement, they want to be part of whatever big event that that foundation is doing in the near future, and they want to be a part of that messaging and conversation. Yeah, and and they. And the expectation is that if you are part of that big club, you will get the notoriety and, and the contributors and all the recognition that you expect to happen. And then they find out, and I'm not knocking anybody, any foundation or any project really for that matter, but typically what they do when we make them sit down and say, okay, if you do this, you're gonna need to tell them this, this, mm -hmm. this, and this. And they're going to do this, this, and this, and that. Um, and then often there's an incompatibility that they weren't even aware of. One of the when you when you join the Apache incubator, there's a checklist of, of questions. And one of the questions that I've never really liked the phrasing of, but the concept is that it's it's uh, do you have a are, are you obsessed with the Apache brand? Is basically the the phrasing there. Um, are you making this decision because you just really love the Apache brand? And, and that's not a good reason for selecting that foundation for your project. It's a small part of the larger picture. So yeah, you, you need to make sure that you understand everything that comes along with the package other than just the brand, the splash, the, the conference, whatever it is. So, right. Yeah, and 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 it and it isn't even a guarantee of a community either. You know, I've I've had discussions sure. where we need more contributors from outside our company, and it's like not not even that. And and again, I'm not knocking anybody, but even at the Apache Foundation, oh, you still got to do the work. You're not going to be guaranteed contributors. It's That's not right. a you know if you build it, they will come kind of thing. Um, so that's, that's another, um, another misconception that we push back, but on, but, and again, I'm not trying to say that foundations don't have positives to offer any given project. Of course. It's just that I think pro Vicky makes a very good point. Projects need to be aware of exactly what they're getting into mm -hmm. and what they need. 
So I think that uh, we, we've come away from this with a number of, of, of lessons. It would be really interesting to, to do a series where we ask this question of a dozen foundations and see if they have a good answer for it. Maybe that's a, a project for another year. <laughs> I'll, I'll put that on the list with the prizes for the contestants. That's right. So, okay. Well, thanks. Thanks, Rich. Got more work to do. All right. But no, I, I do think that that would be a good, a good examination. And, and, and yeah, it might be a little sales pitchy, um, but you would definitely hear the differences mm -hmm. in approaches for each foundation because um, there is no one size fits all here. Absolutely. So I, I definitely think that's a lesson we would come away from this episode and any kind of other examination of that. Yeah. It's a huge spectrum out there. Well, um, once again, we thank you for watching and listening to The Open Road, and we hope to see you again in, in the next episode where we'll be discussing another aspect of, of how foundations work and how projects interact with them. And until then, we hope you have a... Uh, safe and productive day. I'm Rich Bowen. I'm Brian Prophet, and thanks for watching The Open Road. <laughs>